I'd like to start part two of this Alan Holdsworth's Harness video series with uh, some responses to viewer comments. So number one is the point of these videos concerning the harness is not to do a sound demo. It's to explain what the harness is and how it works. There's a lot of other stuff that has to go after it to make it sound good, things that I do not possess. I also do not have an amp with the correct output transformer and or an amp that I'm willing to make a guinea pig. I'm not made of money and some of these amps have irreplaceable tra output transformers, so stick around if you want to learn more. Yes, the air conductors have a steel core when they get bolted to the base plate, which technically makes them not an air conductor, but they start out as an air conductor. It appears to me that the nuts, washers, and bolts that Allen used are standard things that you could get at the hardware store. I'm unable to determine if the base plate in Allen's units are aluminum or steel. It seems as though it's both depending on which unit you look at the inside of. I don't know that it makes a big difference really if it's steel or aluminum, but it might be some small factor in the overall picture. I did find in some preliminary testing with some hand wound coils while I was waiting for my proper inductors to arrive that the addition of these large washers on top of the inductor actually increases the apparent inductance by about 35%. The harness does need an isolation transformer on the line level output to guard against shock hazard, which has happened to some people. I've heard a first-hand account of that. I was thinking of building one into this clone of mine here. The harness is unique. It's not just a power soak. It's a power amp to line level interface. Sure, you can go buy one of the half dozen things on their market today that does the same thing. It's really easy to say that today, but Alan came up with this device in the late 80s, early 90s at a time when there was no such things on the market. So therefore, he was a trailblazer. Since a viewer brought it up, let's take a quick look at the Sur reactive load. Yes, it does roughly the same thing as Alan's harness, but it does it in a different manner. Yes, it has inductors in it, but Alan's unit is unique in the use of the nichrome wire. This wire can handle many hundreds of watts. The 18 gauge wire in my build can handle 10 times the watts needed for a 100 watt amp, as opposed to the 450 watt resistors in the SUR unit. The Nichrom wire also changes resistance with temperature and ceramic resistors don't. The fan in the SUR unit, which requires no external power, is pretty clever though. The SUR unit appears to basically be Eichen's reactive dummy load circuit with a slight tweak. I have asked the same question about why so many inductors in Allen's units. I don't have an answer on that one, but I can demonstrate something interesting about that, which also makes Allen's units unique. One thing that makes Allen Holdsworth's harness unique is the use of the seven inductors. Now there's something interesting going on here that I want to demonstrate. What I'm going to do is take a 10 volt peak to peak sine wave from this function generator and feed it into the input of the harness. And I'm going to also have a function or a frequency counter that's going to um, count the frequency so it's easy to see for me anyways. And we're going to look at what's going on here with this little mini oscilloscope. And I'm going to use this thing I call a snooping coil, which is something I created when I reverse engineered the Ebo about, I don't know, a year and a half ago now. I created this so I could stick it between the sensor and driver coils of the Ebo so I could put this between the Ebo and the guitar strings to determine what type of waveform the Ebo was producing. So I found that this also comes in handy for detecting crosstalk between the coils. Yes, there's going to be crosstalk occurring between them. It's not a huge amount, but I just want to demonstrate that it's there. So let me get the camera set up on a tripod and stuff, and we'll do that. So I have a 10-volt peak-to-peak sine wave coming in the input of the harness here. So we're starting out at 100 hertz, and we're going to take our little snooping coil, and we're just going to stick it next to these inductors. Let me get that adjusted there. Here we go. So as you can see, now we're picking up a sine wave. It's just being transmitted from one coil to the other. Kind of like Wardenclyffe Tower, the Tesla's idea of transmitting power wirelessly. <laughs> um, 
and it's it's a one millivolt peak to peak two millivolt peak to peak uh, sine wave and it's occurring between all of these coils So the interesting thing is that it, it actually increases with frequency, which seems to be backwards of what I would expect. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to stick this scooping coil in between these inductors here. Come on, cooperate. There we go. These are enameled wires. Nothing is actually um, directly touching, so just doing this for convenience so now if we take this up to say 200 Hertz the amplitude still the same pretty much as we go up in frequency it starts to creep up in amplitude so the tops and bottoms of the sine waves are getting taller I don't know if you can hear that in the camera, but I can hear an audible hum coming from here. So you can see now at around 600 hertz, now we're looking at 10, 10 millivolts peak to peak. If we go all the way up to 1 kilohertz, now we're at 16 millivolts peak to peak. Now if we go up to, in the kilohertz range, 2 kilohertz, we're now at 25 millivolts peak to peak, or sorry, 23. 3 kilohertz is 26, we go up to 4 kilohertz, it's 28. 5 kilohertz, now it's 29 millivolts. Let's go up to 7.5. Now it's 30, 31 millivolts of crosstalk happening between these coils and it's happening between all of them as you can see I don't have to touch anything with a, with a naked probe it's just it's like a field around the coils right now when you get to the nichrome wire resistors, you're not really getting much of anything. So I find that interesting. I think that is one of the secret ingredients to Allen's unit. I mean, now compared to a 10 volt peak to peak input signal, you know, like 25 millivolts or whatever is pretty tiny, but nonetheless, the fact is that crosstalk does exist between these coils and that's a $64,000 question is how does that affect the overall picture? Is that doing something that we can't quite put our fingers on? I don't know. It's just something interesting that I thought I'd point out. One thing I need to mention about these inductors is that the crosstalk between these two is actually a lot more significant if I was to say remove this one out of the circuit and just have it connected to the oscilloscope and then feed this one with a sine wave this one will pick up quite a lot of what this inductor is seeing. Um, you can see that in this picture here. Now I did these windings uh, myself just to do tests while I was waiting for these proper inductors to arrive. I just wanted to see what the effect of the crosstalk was. So now that I've demonstrated this crosstalk, the reason why it's happening is basically because these things are all in the same configuration and they're very close together. Normally like in a speaker crossover kind of network where you have a few of these things, you would orient them differently. Like you'd have this one at a 90 degree angle to this one, so it'd be like sitting up on its side so you don't get the crosstalk. Then you can have them close together or the other thing is you just have to keep them far apart so you don't have the crosstalk. But in this case, because everything's so close together, you get the crosstalk. Mounting them in this manner completely eliminates the crosstalk. What we are seeing here in Allen's unit is technically known as mutual inductance coupling. 
So anyways, now that I've demonstrated that, let's take a look at the frequency response and what LT Spice comes up with and what I measure in the real world and we'll see how they compare. So here's the basic LT Spice simulation of the harness. Here's the frequency plot that I generated with a function generator and an oscilloscope by going through various frequencies and writing down the RMS voltages at those frequencies so that I could derive this chart. Comparing the two, you can see that my real world unit has more of a dip between 100 hertz and 1 kilohertz, whereas in LT Spice it's more of a gentle hump. I would think that this would tend to sound pretty harsh just straight into an effects unit. Um, now, one thing to keep in mind, the one caveat here is that my clone doesn't necessarily exactly replicate what Alan's done in his units, but I think I'm probably pretty close. Now, the one thing that this frequency response curve between 100 hertz and 1 kilohertz does do is for Alan, he could manipulate all of the frequencies in the guitar range exactly however he wanted because he's starting out with everything kind of low. So there's lots of room to manipulate, boost things, cut things to get the exact kind of response that he wants to make his guitar basically sound however he wants. This, this is the way he could kind of shape his sound to be whatever he wanted. He wasn't fighting like what the speaker responses and those sorts of things. So keep in mind, this is in the late 80s, early 90s when plugins and Pro Tools and all this stuff didn't exist. He had to do all this stuff manually. So this is where I think there's another area of Alan's genius is he really knew how to shape sounds and manipulate frequencies and stuff to get his unique sound. Okay, so now I've arrived at the trying to figure out the impedance of this circuit part of the video and before I get into that I just want to say that I've seen it presented both ways about what speakers you pair up with an output transformer. I've seen people say it's better to go lower, it's better to go higher. Now I personally ran an 8 ohm speaker load on a 4 ohm output transformer with my Fender Hot Rod uh, 2x12 DeVille for two years, I never had a problem. Um, I never noticed a huge difference in volume, etc. So, anyways, it seems to be the case that you you want to go up or down, like one size, so to speak. You don't want to go put 16 ohms in a 4 ohm output transformer, but eights generally seems to be okay, and so on. So, now I went. I measured, so what I did is I measured stuff, and so my DC resistance between tip and ring here is 9.67 ohms. The total inductance is 9.96 millihenries. The uh, capacitance measures 66 microfarads, measuring from tip to ring here. And so I went to the website and I plugged all this information in, as you can see in this picture here. It's telling me that my resonant frequency is 200 hertz. Now, I don't understand this because I went through from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, and I also use the external horizontal function on my oscilloscope with a, uh, a oscilloscope octopus, which I can sometimes use to determine the resonant frequency of an inductor or something like that. Um, none of these methods work. For determining resonant frequency. So that is one conundrum. I don't understand how it's saying that the resonant frequency is 200 hertz um, when it doesn't show up on the oscilloscope. So <laughs> that has me scratching my head. Um, it's just another one of the secrets that this thing does not want to give up. So there's that. I just skipped right over telling you what the impedance is. The calculated impedance is 9.67 ohms at 200 hertz, which I would be fine running that on an 8 ohm um, output transformer, but on a 4 ohm output transformer, I would be nervous about damaging it. Okay, I took this one step farther. I simulated the impedance in LT Spice using these measured values, and here's what the result was. Notice that the notch is at 200 hertz, which is the same as what the website told me is the resonant frequency. Now, I was under the impression that you could test a circuit like a speaker where you can hear and see 
where the resonant peak is on an oscilloscope, but I guess it doesn't work that way in this case. Here we can see the frequency response versus impedance. Keep in mind that real-world frequency response is a little bit different than the more ideal version presented by LT Spice, but they are not worlds apart. I hope you found these videos interesting. I tried my best to get as close as possible to Alan's unit from the few pictures I was able to find. I studied these pictures for a good while. There's still unanswered questions and things I can't verify without actually having one in hand to examine. I might be off on some things. I might have maybe got some things wrong. If you have an actual harness and want to correct any mistakes I have made or whatever, please comment. And if you can hear Alan belly laughing at my feeble attempt to explain his creation, please also comment and let me know. <laughs> Thanks for watching.